first of all, I'd like to, to thank the organizing committee and Professor Barry Elliott for the invitation for this talk. This is uh, truly, it's a difficult, difficult subject, but I think it's a good challenge. So let's see. I think there are no clear answers here. It's true that probably there is not a right or not a wrong answer for each of these different rare conditions. But let's see. I think this is probably one example of uh, uh, treatment or of, the, of conditions requiring very specific and tailored treatment for every, for every single patient. So this is briefly just the outline of the talk. Probably this is a little bit of a, a spurious separation. Probably cannot really separate these two, but let's see. First of all, this is about rare diseases. So what is the definition for a rare disease? Uh, basically, common sense, any diseases affecting a small percentage of the population can be considered a rare disease. The, only, the question is mainly what is the cutoff? Can it be one in a thousand, one in 200,000? All we know is that there are apparently 5,000 to 7,000 of them. And even though they are rare, as much as six to eight percent of the population in the EU will be affected by at least one of them during their lifetimes. The cutoff in the US is one out of every uh, 1,500 individuals. In Japan, it's a little bit different, but not much. And in, the, in Europe, it's about, or it's about one in 2,000. And the reason why this has been defined like this is also related to the definition of uh, orphan, orphan diseases and also for the funding of research for orphan, orphan disease treatment. So basically, this is a very simple uh, classification of the rare diseases associated with or causing arrhythmias because this is a cardiomyopathy conference and I think these diseases or these syndromes gets a lot of attention. I think we'll just skip this pure channelopathies. But even though they're considered to be rare and if some of them are considered to be extremely rare, there is a lot we don't know. And this is a, a recent survey we've just published which shows that probably short QT syndrome may not be as rare as we thought because if we apply the consensus criteria to a young asymptomatic population, probably may end up with a prevalence of one in a thousand or close to that, which wouldn't meet or which wouldn't fit with most of the with the definitions we've seen before for rare diseases. So just briefly also moving through autoimmune rheumatic disorders. Uh, with regard to rheumatoid arthritis, there's an increased incidence of coronary artery disease. So these patients can present with VT, sudden cardiac death or aborted sudden cardiac arrest. With lupus, we have high incidence of AF. And also, we can also have if there is a, so children to a mother infected with lupus, especially if they have positive antibodies, anti rho or anti-LA, they can de develop congenital heart block and for systemic sclerosis, very high incidence of PVCs. None of these are mentioned in detail in the guidelines because probably at least in the ESC or ACC slash AHA guidelines because they are so specific that they are mentioned in their own specific rheumatology guidelines. And we tend to deal with them just using the broad or just the general guidelines to deal with this situation. This is just a recap because I think most of the discussion in the end of the presentation will be focusing on this, on this classification for class of recommendation and also for level of evidence because these are, these are rare diseases. So we know that for class one recommendations and guidelines, you can say there is agreement that a treatment or an intervention should be recommended or is beneficial. For class three, there is agreement that that specific intervention shouldn't be performed because it can be deleterious or harmful for the patients. And this is an interesting area here. There is no complete uh, agreement or there is conflicting evidence or the, the guideline uh, panel or committee is not in perfect agreement. But if we have a class 2 a indication, probably most of the evidence or most of the opinion is in favor of that intervention. If we have a class 2B, we can still consider performing that procedure, but probably there is, the agreement is not as strong. And then this is what we get for level of evidence. Probably most of you are already familiar with this, but just to, to recap so that we can have a, probably a, a sounder discussion in the end. 
So for level of evidence C, we just got recommendations based on ex expert consensus or very small retrospective observational studies. Level of evidence B, we have evidence for a from a single randomized study or, for, or from large non-randomized studies, and then evidence A, multiple randomized clinical trials or meta-analysis. If you start to think, after looking to this slide, it's obvious that if these are rare diseases, and if we are speaking of arrhythmias in particular, it's going to be very difficult to perform RCTs. So probably what we should be aiming for in the future is for data sharing between expert centers so that we can get large non-randomized studies and eventually performing more and more meta-analysis, ideally on a patient level. So starting with cardiomyopathies. Without wanting to be controversial, if we say that this is the known prevalence, broadly speaking nowadays, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, probably it doesn't fit, it doesn't meet criteria for a rare disease. For that reason, it's excluded from this presentation, but if we have time, I still have some backup slides, we can discuss it in the end. Probably the phenocopies for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, these phenocopies themselves, they meet criteria for rare diseases. And the unfortunate part is that because they do meet criteria for this, we don't really know much about them, but I'll show some slides. Then we have ARVC, the prevalence, and probably here it would be important just to make a distinction between ARVC and whole disease, because some people tend to say that all disease or all disease is a form of ARVC, but if we think of all disease, you know that it is a congenital uh, absence of the parietal layer of the, of the RV, so it's got a different pathophysiology from ARVC, so it shouldn't be really considered a form of ARVC, and for the reason that it doesn't have, there is no myocardium there, there is no fibrosis, there is no fatty infiltration, you don't have a substrate which could make you develop arrhythmias. So we have a small number of cases, but arrhythmia is clearly not a typical presentation for this form of disease. Then you have non-compacted cardiomyopathy. It's got a low prevalence, but we've also seen in some of the pre previous presenta presentations that we should avoid overdiagnosing. For example, there was a recent paper by the St. George's group in uh, black athletes with echocardiogram showing an extremely high prevalence of what they call LV and C or which most likely would be just hypertrabeculation mixed with athlete's heart. heart. So I think it's important to consider it as a low prevalence disease but we don't really know the true prevalence of this. Then you've got idiopathic cardiomyopathy, highly variable prevalence, one in 500, we discussed one in 300 before. We also know that this is a very big bag comprising or combining very different clinical entities. So probably if we gather them or if we pull them all in the same bag, it's going to be probably not that rare. But if we think of the specific causes for dilated cardiomyopathy, probably they will all, them, each one of them be a rare entity. And then this one, Chagasit or, or Chagas cardiomyopathy, doesn't get solved frequently here in Europe, but we should be probably a little bit more uh, aware of it, and sarcoid cardiomyopathy discussed before in detail. So just starting with ARVC, I think this applies for all of these conditions. There is no, no doubt that if you're speaking of a secondary prevention patient, if you have an aborted sudden cardiac death episode, if you have documentation of sustained VT, I think probably, and if you have an expected longevity of more than a year, you have good quality of life, and if you, as a patient, are willing to have an ICD and are aware, and if you are aware of the complications, the possible complications associated with these devices, I think that probably no one here would have any doubts of offering a, an ICD for that specific patient, that particular patient. However, the main problem is primary prevention. So we've got this big set of risk factors. I'll go through them later. We know that for medical therapy, beta blocker specific sotolol should be the mainstay treatment. So secondary prevention ICDs, so no doubt, so 1C. So not a lot of RCTs here, but probably to also be a little bit ethical, ethically debatable. Then if patients don't do well with beta blockers, we could consider amiodarone. And then 
catheter ablation for specific subsets of patients dealing with frequent VT, and especially after they already have an ICD and keep on receiving therapies, because we know that even though ICDs prevent sudden death and save lives, if you keep on getting repeated therapies, this is also associated with an increased mortality. So catheter ablation can have a role there, but we also know that ablation or VT ablation is not associated with improvement in prognosis. So you should think of it more as an intervention for palliation or improvement in symptoms and quality of life. Different indications for secondary prevention depending on how well the VT is tolerated. And then here we have the indication for primary prevention ICD. So it's only 2B. So I would say that most of the experts probably wouldn't be in favor of it, but for some specific situations and also depending on the type of risk factors you have and the number of risk factors you have, probably you should consider it. So if you have an unexplained syncope, frequent non-sustained PT, a fast family history of premature sudden cardiac death, and if you have an extensive substrate with marked compromise of your RVF and areas of fibrofatty infiltration, probably you wouldn't be denying a patient, an ICD to this patient. But I think this all needs to be assessed on a case-to-case -case basis, and unfortunately, we don't have a sudden cardiac death, death risk calculator for this group yet. Then there's also, it's also important to highlight that an invasive EP study can be of importance in these patients, especially because if you perform electroanatomical mapping, you can de detect or you cannot detect them extensive areas of uh, low voltage, which would be correlate with fibro fatty infiltration, and also you can, also you can test the inducibility of ventricular tachycardia in these patients. So if they're easily inducible with VT, you can also expect them to go into VT if they experience a PVC in the wrong moment during their life. What about phenocopies? Just a brief example on Fabry disease, just to highlight something I found particularly interesting. Even though the Holcomb risk calculator has not been validated for phenocopies or for specific populations like uh, children aged less than 16, this is just a small group of authors who wrote this paper and they suggested that potentially for asymptomatic patients with a sudden cardiac death risk score above 6%, like you do for Hocum patients, you could consider an ICD for this population, but here you don't have any class of recommendation. This is just a general, based on common sense recommendation, but this also once again brings us to the need of discussing these patients on a patient-to-patient -patient basis. So restrictive cardiomyopathy, just to highlight, highlight that even if you don't have atrial fibrillation, this is thrombogenic, very dilated atria, so also bringing us to the thought that if you have left atrial, endostolic, uh, left atrial endothelial dysfunction, you may have fibrosis, in the atrium, and even if you don't have AF, you just have stasis, and you have a prothrombotic milia, so this is important. So patients in sinus rhythm could potentially also benefit from oral anticoagulation in this situation. For ICDs, once again, secondary prevention, no doubt that if they've got an expected lifespan ahead of them, they should be considered, but for primary prevention data, we don't have any evidence. And the guidelines just say that there is no data, so just use the general guidelines. Think of the 35% cutoff. This is a little bit disappointing, especially if you think of the Danish trial, but this is what we currently have, or what we currently don't have. We lack evidence. For amyloidosis, just to highlight that, sudden death is frequent, but some of these cases happen in the setting of electromechanical dissociation. So I don't know if a device would be doing much here. Even though in some cases there is documentation of ventricular tachycardia and those patients could in theory benefit from the device, but if for some of, some of these conditions the expected lifespan is not that long, probably the ICD will not improve quality of life and probably it's not going to alter the course of the disease. So this should be discussed with the patients and also we should have the good and clear <clears throat> documentation of the expected prognosis. So once again, longevity expected to be above one year, and uh, this is once again for secondary prevention, so primary prevention, no data. Left ventricular non-compaction, no specific recommendations on the guidelines. So another example of the large unknown that 
we face. So use the same recommendations. Common sense, base your judgment on in the degree of LV dysfunction, presence of arrhythmias. There is an interesting small series of patients which has shown that 43% of patients implant, implanted in primary or secondary prevention experienced appropriate ICD interventions. However, more and more we know that an appropriate ICD intervention is not necessarily a surrogate for saving a life because in some cases these episodes of VT might just self-terminate. However, this is what we have. We're just going to use the regular or the standard guidelines for these patients and discuss them in MDTs based on their specific risk factors. So probably I'll give a little bit more of emphasis to Chagas cardiomyopathy now. Even though this is highly frequent in Latin, in Latin America, we don't tend to see a lot of these patients here. Basically, this is the, the parasite involved, Trypanosoma cruzi. This is the vector Triatoma infestans, known as the barber bug or the kissing bug. And uh, we know that after an acute phase, 70% of patients go into a dormant phase, the undetermined phase, where they're still present, positive serology, but no, morpholo no morphology, no morphologic changes. But a third of patients can progress and develop chronic Chagas cardiomyopathy. There can be some form of autoimmune immune element here, probably like for viral myocarditis. And this is the, these are the endemic areas, so Central America and also southern part of Brazil, Chile, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia. And this is the reason why we have to think of this condition more and more. This continent is associated with huge migratory movements. This is from 2008, and this is the expected number of individuals with Chagas cardiomyopathy living in Europe, and if we think of the UK, it should be around 1,400. Divided, if we divide this by the total population, it does meet criteria for rare disease here. But this is also a slide which was much busier, so this is just a Brexit version of the slide, with the UK here highlighted, which confirms the data. I think this is from 2008, but we know that things have changed. We still have migratory movements and probably the number of individuals, individuals currently here in the UK is going to be higher than 1,300 for sure, probably 2,000 now. And what is the problem with these individuals? Is that NHS access can be a problem because they don't come from Europe and because some of them they have, may have some issues with their legal status, they have trouble in transitioning to the system. What do the European guidelines say about this population. They say that if you've got an LVF of less than 40%, you will be a candidate for a primary prevention ICD. Class 2A level of evidence C. They don't mention the possibility of catheter ablation. However, just check the Latin American guidelines because they're clearly the, the cardiologists with more experience in the field, in the disease, and they've got a slightly different view in how to deal with Chagas cardiomyopathy. This is for catheter ablation, and probably, and this is an important thing to highlight because we have nowadays two forms of performing or two approaches for ventricular tachycardia ablation, endocardial approach, and we've got the epicardial approach which was developed in San Paulo especially or just because of patients with Chagas disease because it's very commonly the substrate was located in the epicardium. So Dr. Souza and Skenavaka, they had to find a way to access this cavity and they just developed the subxiphoid approach. And we tend to see that in Latin America they are, they use catheter ablation a lot to deal with these patients. And if we see the level of evidence for patients with, with incessant VT, so it's a clear indication with recurrent sustained VT, patients with recurrent paroxysmal monomorphic VT, resistant to antiarrhythmic drugs, some patients already after the first episode, class 2B. And if we think of ICDs, there is a clear difference uh, comparing with the European guidelines. Apparently, trials in Latin American, Latin American haven't shown the benefits of this device for Chagas disease, and there is no recommendation for primary prevention ICDs based on these guidelines here. All the recommendations are for secondary prevention. With regard to sarcoidosis, this has been discussed before. We know it's a very aggressive entity, and the guidelines just mention the secondary prevention indication.
probably should think of this also as primary prevention if there is a dilated cardiomyopathy associated with this. And I think the other important thing to bear in mind is that if you've got recurrent arrhythmias, probably part of the intervention will also be, also be immunosuppression. Don't rush into a device because sometimes you can control things and also as with the viral myocarditis, I don't know, probably not as much with sarcoidosis, but things may settle down. There may be some partial improvement of LVF, so I wouldn't run to a device, but this patient's, in this patient, this tends to be recurring. And you may get to a state where you need catheter ablation, which is not mentioned in the guidelines. This is a recent meta-analysis meta -analysis we performed of low quality evidence because there are no RCTs, but just based on case series from on the largest case series, and you end up with this number of 83 patients. This is what we have. 83 patients having catheter ablation for recurrent VT resistant to antiarrhythmic drugs, and VT ablation is effective. We don't know what it does to clinical outcomes, if there is a survival benefit, but I think this is currently considered a last resource option, but probably we will need some RCTs in the future for an earlier intervention. With regard to muscular dystrophies, I'll be very brief just to highlight that in some, some of these patients die at a, at a young age because of respiratory failure, but sudden cardiac death can also play a role in some of them. The guidelines are also very broad, and this is an aspect which called our attention at, at parts. And some patients get an, uh, have got an indication for a pacemaker when they have a first degree AV block. These are the joint 2006 American and European guidelines. This is with regard to the use of an ICD in specific entities, which we know are associated with higher risk because they have or they're associated with the lamin AC mutation. So there is here an overlap between familial cardiomyopathy with lamin AC and some muscular dystrophies. And we decided to perform an assessment of our patients at Bart and the Heart Hospital at the time because the indications for an EP study in this population weren't really clear. Some centers, EP studies performed if you have a broad QRS, QRS or if you have first degree EP block, but what our results show is that probably all these patients should have at least one EP study and then according to the progression of their ECG they should be considered for repeat EP studies. The measure that is associated with increased risk of a sudden cardiac death or with a need or an indication for a pacemaker is an HV interval of more than 70 milliseconds. And patients managed invasively and implanted with a device with an HV of above 70 milliseconds have experienced a survival benefit. So during an EP study, you place your catheters inside your heart, and this is the area of interest. Close to the AV node, you can get a HIS potential, and you can measure this interval, the HV. This is just a curious example, just to show a patient with a PR interval of 200 milliseconds, and you would say probably PR of 200 milliseconds should we do an EP study, borderline first degree AP block, would this patient be a candidate for a pacemaker? And the HV interval, measuring from the H to the surface ECG, is 90 milliseconds, so. It's clearly a prolonged HV interval in a patient with an indication for a device just hiding under a relatively normal ECG. So this calls or draws the attention to the fact that based on the, res on the results we got, based initially on 90 patients, but this have now been updated, we have nearly 200 patients. And what we know is that if you have, even if you have a normal PR interval, you can still get a third of patients with an HV above 70 milliseconds. So even if you have a normal ECG, you should consider a diagnostic EP study. And on the other hand, just basing your decision on your PR interval alone may not be enough. If you have a prolonged PR, you still get 60% of patients with a normal HV. Of course, this can progress in the future, and these patients may end up developing a long HV interval, so they may need some future uh, a repeat EP study or other alternatives for monitoring but I think this just shows that the guidelines are clearly insufficient, and if you think of your PR interval for deciding who gets a pacemaker, probably you're not going to be implanting all the patients requiring this device, and you're going to be implanting also a lot of patients who don't require it in the first place. So Emory Dreyfus syndrome, just an example of a neuromuscular disease with a lamin AC mutation,
This is just a typical presentation. First degree P block, atrial arrhythmias with atrial standstill. So this is also associated with a high systemic embolism burden, dilated cardiomyopathy. And in these patients with lamin AC mutations, we tend to be a little bit more aggressive. And if they've got a pacing indication, if they need a device, probably we should consider an ICD right away because most of these patients will end up experiencing appropriate therapies. Very similar to limb girdle muscle dystrophy. And going back to dilated cardiomyopathy to familial forms, so laminacy mutation can be found in approximately 5 to 10% of them. I think this highlights the fact that in primary prevention, laminacy mutation cases, the cutoff for LVF should be 45%. And being a male is also a risk factor. Specific types of mutations are risk factors. And non-sustained PT shows right away that this is a more aggressive or more arrhythmogenic form of dilated cardiomyopathy. The other thing is that even if you're in sinus rhythm, if you've got compromised LVF, this may also be a particular subset of patients where there may be a benefit of anticoagulation. And this is the study which shows that if you've got a pacing indication, probably should be offered an ICD because the incidence of appropriate therapies for VT and especially for VF is very high. Probably, I don't know if this will be controversial, most of you may by now be aware of the Castle AF study, which was a randomized study, study offering catheter ablation of AF to one arm and conventional treatment with anticoagulation and antiarrhythmics to the remaining patients. And the inclusion criteria involved having an LVEF of less than 35%. This is what we observed. So these are the original slides, so they are not, they are unformatted. But what we can see is that for the composite endpoints of all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization, there is a clear benefit of ablation. And this slide is even more important for all-cause mortality. You've got a number needed to treat of seven patients with LVEF of less than 35% and AF, seven patients to save a life. So in conclusion, we've got different treatment options for dealing with these arrhythmias antiarrhythmics, beta blockers, mainstay of therapy, amiodron, a good alternative but highly toxic. We've got catheter ablation. For VT ablation, just like for every other form of disease, it hasn't been shown yet to have an impact on prognosis, but it should be used for patients with recurrent shocks and to improve their quality of life. For AF, after this number needed to treat of seven to save a life, does this mean that we should be very aggressive from start after the first episode of AF and refer these patients and consider an ablation this, in this population of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy or other forms of rare disease? Especially with HOCAM, because if we consider HOCAM, and if we mention the 50% LVF threshold, probably should be thinking about this intervention sooner and sooner. This is what we know for ICDs. Primary prevention is still a big unknown, and just a slide to show that the guidelines are not really that helpful. Because if you think of class one recommendations, it's only a quarter of the recommendations. So class one, what you should do, and class three, what you shouldn't do, you've only have, you only have here 40% of the recommendations. And for all other recommendations, you don't have a clear convergence of opinion. And the other thing is that all the evidence or all the recommendations are based on expert of consensus agreement. So we need more trials, or if we cannot do trials because these diseases are rare, probably we should have more cooperation among expert centers to build huge databases which could address these questions. And more and more these are rare diseases and probably it doesn't happen here in the UK, but in other countries, these patients should be referred more and more to highly specialized centers so that more experience can be gathered for the optimal treatment and improvement of their prognosis.